once you have, you know, you think when you don't have anything, well, if I just had enough, I could help so much. I could help so much, but it's dangerous to give to people. You can crush them with the weight yeah. of the responsibility. And no, you're uh, right. yeah, and th so this isn't something that can be taken lightly. It has to be, and you have to ask for help, you know, along the way that, so these you know, these ideas that people have right now of wanting to fix the world and that they're going to do this and that it's something they can do. It's, it's so complicated and it's more likely that they're going to just destroy everything rather than help anything. I mean, often when you're going to fix something, you're going to destroy it first. You have to be prepared for the yeah. fact that things may fall apart before they get better. And are you ready for that? Right. And these people, they're not ready for that. Often they don't even have a, they don't have any means to support if, if everything falls on them. Here I am I am with Dr. Peterson in Bucharest, Romania. We're almost done our, European leg of our tour. I would like to thank you for coming on to my podcast. Today I'm introducing a podcast I did with Jonathan Pajot, it's probably last December. I'm not quite sure when it was done. It was the second podcast that I did with Jonathan and we were discussing the sorrowful mysteries of the Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We did about four podcasts on that, which you can find on my YouTube channel. The conversations were very interesting. I really enjoyed speaking to him, so I spoke to him four times. And uh, this is the second one. So with that, I hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, the idea is to discuss the sorrowful mysteries and um i went i have a few questions that i investigated that i'd like to jump off from but we can talk about whatever it is that comes up mm -hmm. so i'll start with my first question so in the sorrowful mysteries it's uh, uh jesus is uh in the garden and praying uh, with his disciples, and he is taken away to Pilate. He's he's um, Judas is is uh, tells the uh, tells the the police where he is, and so they they take him. They take him away. And so now he's with Pilate and then he goes to Pilate and Pilate has his, this, and this is very interesting what happens with Pilate, or at least it, I'm, I'm starting to understand what it means and it's quite interesting. So Pilate gives the crowds and us a choice. Who does Pilate release? Jesus, the king of the Jews, in whom Pilate finds no guilt, or Barabbas, is that how you say his name? Barabbas. Barabbas, but I mean, I, Barabbas. I think Barabbas, Barabbas, a violent revolutionary. Jesus' accusers ask for Barabbas. How does the story uh, relate to our lives? It's interesting. One of the really interesting things about that story is that in some of the early versions of the Gospels, like the early text and some of the early commentaries, uh, it, it says that Barabbas' name is also Jesus. And so it's actually like two, two saviors because Jesus is the savior, right? He's a, it's a, <clears throat> and so it's Joshua, right? J Jesus is Joshua is the one who saves the, who kind of saves, who takes the promised land. And so in a way it's two visions of how to uh, bring change to the world. Like how, how is it that you change the world, right? How is it that you how do things change? And so you have the one which is the violent revolutionary, not just violent revolutionary, but also like a murderer and a criminal. And then you have this figure that spoke and, uh, you know, healed. And, you know, he he's in a way, he, he, it almost ends up making you feel like on the one hand, it shows you that speech is the true way to transform reality because 
Jerusalem gets destroyed because of people like Barabbas. I mean, because of the Romans, but like the conflict between the Romans and people like Barabbas is what causes the destruction of Jerusalem just a few years after the, the, the resurrection of Christ. Um, but Christ ends up transforming Rome in the long term. So, you know, 30 years after the death of Christ, approximately Rome is destroyed, but 300 years after the death of Christ, Rome is transformed by Christ. So there's a, there's a bigger story going on. Obviously, people will say that it's not there because the gospel was written before the change happened, but we can see that, that it really is a choice between the two. And it, right now, it's such a great vision because we have this situation where we, we, we some people want that Barabbas character. And they, they, um, they want the revolutionary or they want just the social change without the deeper spiritual transformation. And I think that it's useful to meditate on that for us right now. But the, the deeper spiritual change or the, the change of your own heart is the one that ends up causing true change in the long term. Because it doesn't set up the problem with social, like political change is that it always sets up a, di a dialectic, you know, so every action causes a reaction, right? So it's not, you can see it in, in a lot of the political activism today, people go out in the street and do things and then they're surprised to see that there's a reaction. They get arrested, they don't understand why they, you know, or, or, or counter protests come and, and stop them or, or confront them and they don't understand why. It's like, yeah, that's how the world of politics works. But when you transform people from the inside, then that transformation doesn't cause that, that dialectic conflict. It's more like a seed planted, which then gathers things together and produces fruit in the, in the long term. So that's what I think we're seeing there. So later in the story, um, Pilate is not ready to condemn Jesus to death. Instead, Pilate has Jesus flogged. In the process <clears throat> of torturing Jesus, the soldiers ironically coronate him king. They crown Jesus with thorns and dress him in a purple robe. Then the soldiers mockingly but truthfully hail Jesus as the king of the Jews. How does this story resemble our choices? I don't... That story... <laughs> That story is one of the, I think that moment is one of the most profound moments in scripture. I, I don't know how much it resembles our lives because I don't think we reach that level. In terms of Christ, what you're seeing is you're seeing Christ transform. I mean, you could say, you could, you could see it in a way. What you're seeing is that you're seeing Christ secretly transform his, his suffering into glory. That's what you're noticing. And so it's everybody thinks this is happening, but what's truly happening is an actual worship of the king. So it's like a double irony, you know, that's what's going on in that story. And the, the ultimate example of that is in the crown of thorns, because the thorns are the consequence of the fall in the story of Genesis. So it's one of the main consequences God tells Adam and Eve. He says, Adam and Eve, you have to leave the garden. You know, you have to work and the world will produce thorns. And those thorns are like the opposition of the world. They're, they're you know, basically a, a bunch of spiky things in the world that will hurt you if you're not careful. Um, and so they're an image of death. They're an image of uh, multiplicity as well. Breakdown because it's not one point. It's many points, but it's all these spiky points that are that are pointing in every direction. Um, and so here in this story, Christ takes the very consequence of death the very consequence of the fall and it's put up into it's made into a crown and so it acts it really is an image of changing death into glory and uh and i think that in a way it really that's the story of christ right that's what christ does all the time that's what that's the mat the, that's the operation that he brings is so it does resemble a little bit kind of what Jordan says, where it's like, it's not about avoiding suffering. It's not about avoiding hostility, avoiding all these things. But there's a way in which through, through an inner transformation, you, you can, those can be transformed into 
glory, or you could say transformed into purpose, transformed into meaning is a simpler way of saying it. Uh, and so, so it, it gives meaning to, to our sacrifices. It gives meaning to our, to the, the obstacles we face. It changes their nature. So then Pilate goes out to Jesus accusers again and declares Jesus innocent a second time. Mm. And uh, Jesus comes out under his own power, still in control, dressed up as a king. Uh, Pilate calls Jesus the man, as in the son of man. Mm. And the chief priests and the police demand that Pilate crucify Jesus. Presented with their crowned king, the innocent son of man, Jesus' accusers fulfill his words. When you have lifted up the son of man, then you will realize that I am he. They finally bring their charge against Jesus to Pilate. Jesus claims to be the son of God. How, how is this a crime in Jewish law? I don't quite understand. So you've got, the way to understand it is you've got two, two situations happening where it is that all the Romans care about is whether or not Christ is a revolutionary, whether or not he wants to supplant Rome. So Pilate asks, him, like, what's, you're a king, what's your kingdom? And Christ answers, like, my kingdom is not of this world. This is not the type of kingdom that I'm trying to establish. And so Pilate says, okay, well, he's empty. He, he's, I mean, he, he's, a, he's not empty, he's innocent. But what the, the, the Jewish religious scholars and, and the, the, the priests and the, the, the important people in that community, they're annoyance with with Jesus is not that he's a political revolutionary. Their annoyance with him is that he's presenting himself as a as a divine figure. Right? He's presenting himself as son of God. And son of man is actually worse. People don't realize that when Christ says he's the son of man, where there's a suggestion that he's a son of man, it's actually much worse because the son of man is a character in the Old Testament in the in the, in the book of Daniel, especially, where it describes a figure up in heaven sitting next to God, who is also and who is sent by God in a way that is suggests that he is also God. And so this so there's an idea of already this idea of like God, the father and God, the son, which is hinted at in the book of Daniel. And so when he says he's the son of man, it's like. People are freaking out because he's 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 kind of he's attributing uh, divinity to himself, um, and so that's the, that's the, the the problem in terms of understanding the story. Like, what's the conflict? Why are why are why are they insisting? Um, and so so then so Christ is is a blasphemer, you know, to them, um, and he's also a threat to their order because what he's presenting is something like. The way that we understand it, at least the way Christians understand it, that he's presenting the key to the law, right? He's saying, okay, yeah, there's all these laws, but here's the key, right? Here's the, here's the thing towards which it all culminates. Um, and, uh, and that's troublesome. Like it's not, people don't, are not happy with that because it looks like he's destabilizing the system. So that's what's going, that's what's, that's the, I think the best way to understand what's happening in terms of why is it that Pilate is saying he's innocent uh, and then the Jews are insisting that that he's guilty because they're not talking about the same crime ultimately. Crime of the world and crime of from heaven, like both both those. There's a heavenly crime and a and a social crime. Mm. I see, but really. When it all comes down and he's resurrected, they find out that what they thought was a social crime and a heavenly crime actually overcame all of that. He overcame all of that. Yeah, that's, the, that's, why, that's one of the reasons why the resurrection is, is kind of key to, to all of this. Um, <clears throat> But there's a way in which what, what also Christ is doing is really 
is revealing a secret about how reality works. He's revealing a secret about how, like I said, how transformation happens. And this is something which you can really sympathize with the people that are there because it doesn't seem like what he's saying, the things that he says are reasonable and the things that he's doing are reasonable because he, he understands that the, the, the source of reality is something like sacrifice, that the way in which the world actually exists is through sacrifice. Now, it's something that, it's something that people have understood forever, that, let's say, generally, that is, that you have to sacrifice things for the world to exist, right? Jordan talks about this all the time. You know, and so you, 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 sacrificing is almost like, a, it's almost like an investment, right? You're sacrificing something because you know that it'll gather the world together in a way that will produce more later. Um, but it's also more technically the world exists through sacrifice because in order for anything to exist, it has to, it has to cut off some aspect of it. You know, it has to sacrifice idiosyncrasy to cohere. So think about a group. That's what a group has to do, like a, a team. A team has to sacrifice some of the idiosyncrasies of the players or players that aren't really fully participating in the team in order for it to exist. So it kind of exists on sacrifice. And then for the players, that appears as sacrifice as well. Right? They're giving up some of their idiosyncrasies in order to participate in the team. Now, what Christ is revealing is that the secret of sacrifice or the way to solve the problem of sacrifice is self-sacrifice. Is that if you sacrifice other things, you run into all these problems. Like you, you run, if you sacrifice scapegoats and you sacrifice the stranger or you sacrifice the weak person, you know, or you, you put all the, all the bad stuff, you know, you find someone and you say they're guilty of all our problems, you know kind of like similar to what seems to be happening right now, then you have a serious, you have a serious problem because you end up cutting off some aspect of reality. Um, and then that aspect of reality you come off is always a danger that it's going to come back and take its revenge on you, you know, because it doesn't, doesn't necessarily want to be cut off. Um, and so here, what Christ is revealing is that the true nature of the world, the, the true way to, tr to transform and to cohere is, is to do it yourself, to do it consciously of your own will and to sacrifice yourself or sacrifice some aspects of yourself at a lower level, right? For us, it's like, how can I say this? For us, it's, it's not necessarily as high as what Christ does, but let's say a father, to be a good father, has to sacrifice aspects of himself in order to be a good father. He has to sacrifice some of his desires, sacrifice some of his interests. That's absolutely necessary. And so Christ is kind of revealing this secret uh, in a way, in the highest way possible. So I understand this as limitations. So we uh, accept our limitations. We accept that we have limitations and that, that, and that um, existing within these limitations will be redeeming. Now, how do you figure out this is a question. How do you figure out what limitations? You, so as a father, as a father, how do you decide what to limit and what to uh, insist on? Mm. Be, right? Because you're going to have some things you think are necessary. What do you decide is necessary and what is something you can let go of? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it ends up being something like the, the purpose of what you're doing, where right? the purpose seems to contain in itself at least the, the pattern of what it is that you need to do or what it is that you need to sacrifice. But then there's also a dance, which is not, is not something you can, um, you can fully settle in. Like you can't say, this is what you need to do all the time. That's not how it works. So <laughs> let's say to think about like a good example with a father is a good example because you have to sacrifice uh, some aspect of your, let's say, career and some aspect of your drive towards success or drive towards accomplishing things in the world in order to be a good father. That's absolutely necessary. But you have to be careful because you, you, in order to be a good father, you also have to be admired by your children because you want them to be able to see you as a role model. And so because of that, you, you have to be careful because you, you can't sacrifice all of that drive 
towards success and accomplishing things. Because in your accomplishment, your children will see a, 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 will see an example of, of how to, to exist in the world. And so it ends up being this dance where you're constantly going a little too far in one direction and then going and doing it into an, going towards the other direction and trying to keep that swerve in a way that is, that is not excessive, let's say. At least that's the way that I, that I see it. And for women, say mothers then, in the, same, in the household, um, there's got to be limits on what she uh, can express herself. So, so what kind of endeavors that she can partake in uh, in order to be a good mother. And those things that, because often uh, a mother will give up too many, too much of herself. And in doing so, uh, can undermine the goodness that she's giving to her children, right? So that's also, there's definitely a dance there that has to be understood. And, uh, and it's tricky because what do you decide are those things that you're going to give up? And what are those things you can't give up? So it's... Yeah, and that's one of those things where attention is the best, really, the solution to that. Whereas that if you're capable of being attentive to what's happening and attentive to the consequences of your actions, then that won't be too much of a problem. It will be. I mean, it'll always be a problem, but it won't be too much of a problem because you'll notice, you know, that if, you know, in for a mother, it's, it's the same thing. You know, if you, let's say you want, you're saying, yeah, I want my, my home to be beautiful, and, and in order, in order for, you know, for my kids to understand that there's standard and that to feel well in the house, like, yeah, that's great. But if you go, obviously, if you go too far, then it becomes a museum and then your children can't exist in that house. Uh, and the other way is true as well. Like if you just say, oh, well, their kids, let them be what they are and they, and it just becomes a, a pigsty, then it's, then that's not good as well. Cause the children will be miserable in both of those situations. So it's like how to find this balance of, of flexibility, you know, uh, but also a certain sense of order and a certain sense of decorum for, for your children to thrive in or for your family to thrive in, you know. And so that's it's a it's interesting because it really shows you how life can't be reduced to a set of of uh, just a set of like rules that you have to follow. But it really is, you know, there are maybe these higher rules that induce this this pattern or this, this kind of dance back and forth between, between two opposites. And I think with, uh, I'm thinking about myself and uh, as a mother, um, the dance would be between uh, say my uh, relationship with my kids and their well being in my house and what I want to do with my life. And so in preparing my house for my children, in giving that the proper amount of time, then I'll have time to spend on those other things that fulfill my uh, creative side or um, whatever that other side might be, if it's creative or if it's practical. Mm. Uh, but, you know, there's, well, there's all the other things that go along with being a mother. You have to garden, you have to, you have to forage, and those things you can do with your children to some extent, but always realizing that there are limits to what you can bring your children along with and what they need to learn on their own. So there's, there's this, this dance goes in many different ways. So it's, yeah. Well, it's, it's yeah. like, uh, especially for raising kids, you know, it's almost like, it's like a medicine or the idea of a crutch, right. Where you, you're like, okay, my, my child needs to do this. So I'll offer them a support right. To give them, to kind of show them the moves and show them how to do it. But there's a, you have to remove the support at, at some point or else then it becomes uh, a hindrance to their success. But that's, that's really hard, right? Well, it's not hard, but it's a, it's not something which you can just say, this is how to do it. It's, you kind of have to be attentive to the situation and see how the child is reacting and, you know, and, and adjust. And sometimes also you can do it in a family. What I've noticed is that you can do it with the two people. So like my wife and I, we have different temperaments. And uh, if I, if it was just me, like 
everything would just be chaos around me because I'm, I have that artist kind of chaotic aspect to myself. But it also means that I, I'm able to induce certain reactions and certain conversations, let's say, because of that capacity to improvise and capacity to, uh, and my wife, she's more, she's the one who will plan, she'll plan outings, she'll plan all this stuff. You know, she, she's great at getting things done, but her tendency is also to be maybe a little too controlling. And so it's like how to find that, that balance. And sometimes it, it can actually, it's interesting because sometimes it can manifest itself as a little conflict between you. Uh, and that's actually, it's like, in the end, it's okay. I remember in the first years of, our, of my marriage, I thought it was the end of the world. But then at some point you realize, no, you know what? It's actually okay. It actually ends up, it greases the wheel and makes it turn. You know, at some point it's like, okay, Jonathan, you have to, you're going too far. Like, like we need to, we need to put things, you know, straighten things up again. Uh, you know, so, yeah. So, so I, I think that I, that could all in a family, at least I've seen it can happen in both. In our relationship, uh, it, with all the illness that we'd had and all of the mm. uh, chaos that uh, came into our lives because of that in, in every way, part of that chaos was financial because we weren't paying t- attention to uh, the day-to-day or month-to-month uh, books. Uh, and Jordan is the, mm, he's the creative side of things that his mind is going here and there and everywhere. Um, and I'm more the person who, is feeling uh, the need for uh, everything to balance. And yesterday we had a meeting. I was in on a business meeting, and I've put myself forward now to be a part of the business where I wasn't before. But I, I found once I was getting better and Jordan was still gone, it was necessary for me to step in. Uh, I could see that there was a, a need for order there. And uh, it was interesting to see George yesterday asking me to be there, uh, recognizing mm. that, which hasn't been in the past, but now is more obvious, I think, to him, where where the order comes from in our relationship and where the creativity comes from and that they are both necessary in every aspect of everything that we do. Yeah. But I, I would say that that understanding of that has only been really recognized, I guess, for, by both of us in the last, in the very last few years. And we've been married for like 32 years. Mm-hmm. But you've also <laughs> haven't had so much pressure and so much, right. you know, so much tra- change in your lifestyle and your, yeah, in your revenue and everything changed so radically in a few years that I imagine it takes, a, and with all the sickness it takes a while to, it's like a shock to the system that forces you to make some decisions or else it's yeah. not going to, it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, I had no idea. We've never had this amount of responsibility. And uh, as anybody would imagine, with a huge increase in responsibility, there's a learning curve. And it takes uh, who knows how long to get yeah. on top of that. And if you don't get on top of it, everything's gone. Mm. You, you Right? <laughs> so you have to be learning as fast as you can and yeah. trying to keep up. So. That's been that's been really something. Let's see what else do I have in here over there. Okay, so Pilate is more frightened than ever by the possibility that Jesus might be the Son of God. He enters the headquarters again and asks Jesus Jesus a foundational question: uh, Where are you from? But Jesus gives no answer. Uh, in his previous encounter with Pilate, Jesus tried to invite the Roman governor, into God's kingdom and was rejected. So this time he doesn't say anything. He remains silent. Uh, Pilate threatens Jesus with his political power over life and death, but Jesus is not impressed. Jesus points to the one from above who has ultimate power over life and death and in so doing answers Pilate's question about where he comes from. Uh, my question is, how, how do we make these same choices in our life between, between Pilate's idea of what's necessary and what Jesus says is necessary and where, is he, where he's from and where he will be destined to find his 
salvation as well. So we have to decide, make those decisions in our lives. Mm. Yeah. And recognize how do we recognize what decisions we're making if where we're coming from hmm. yeah where we're coming from <laughs> mm-hmm. well the one thing that's interesting it, it's interesting it actually connects what you were talking about before is is that you know pilot says basically pilot pilot is relying on his political power or worldly power you know brute brute force um and Christ understands that that's nothing without what comes from above. That without something coming from above, your power is nothing. And it's interesting because you said that even before. You said, all of a sudden, there's all this change, all this responsibility, all this new revenue, all these new opportunities, all this stuff. But that stuff is meaningless unless it's connected to something higher. It could, it's actually could be dangerous. It just can just be dangerous and destructive, right? The, the idea, you know it because you've, you hear all these stories of people who win the lottery and it destroys their life, right? And it increased power without connection to something which comes from on high, which comes from above, then is, is the self-destructive and, and just not useful. Um, and so what Christ is, re- is really revealing the idea that we, that your purpose, like the, the highest thing, the things that are invisible, that aren't in the world, those are the real things that give reason, give meaning, give purpose. You know, those are the things that hold it all together. And so, and Christ is obviously doing the, doing the ultimate play on that because he's basically saying, I'm directly, like I come, I am the logos. I'm the actual divine logos that created the world. And that that is you know i am th- this idea of the source of everything you know kind of manifesting itself and so that source is for us at least it's the image of of our virtues it's the image of you know the higher purposes we have you know the the the, the noble purposes we have and that those are actually what holds us together not all this stuff that we that we gather and the stuff can be useful, right? If it's well aligned, but if it's not, it's, it's actually it's actually destructive. So when you have revenue, so I have revenue now that I never had before, and you want to share it, you know, you want you want to spread it around. And the first thing that I noticed was that I couldn't just give people money. Right? You can't you can't just give people money. Because I mean, I was given some money for for what we've gone through. And it's been, well, who knows what it's done to us? It's nearly killed us, right? Mm-hmm. So you don't want to just you have what you have to do is you have to uh, you have to really pay attention to the person that you're wanting to give to. Or this is what I found. You had to pay attention to the person you want to give to. And you have to see where there's a lack somewhere. And recognize a lack somewhere. And then offer to, to uh, um, to give what you have as a, as a bridge to help them with somewhere where there is a lack and it's very tricky. I've found it's much more difficult to do the right thing. Once, once you have, you know, you think when you don't have anything, well, if I just had enough, I could help so much. I could help so much, but it's dangerous to give to people. You can crush them with the weight yeah. of the responsibility. And oh, you're uh, right. yeah, and th- so this isn't something that can be taken lightly it has to be and you have to ask for help you know along the way that so these you know these ideas that people have right now of wanting to fix the world and that they're going to do this and that it's something they can do (laughs) it's it's so complicated and it's more likely that they're going to just destroy everything rather than help anything I mean, often when you're going to fix something, you're going to destroy it first. You have to be prepared for the yeah. fact 
that things may fall apart before they get better. And are you ready for that? Right? And these people, they're not ready for that. Often they don't even have a, they don't have any means to support if, if everything falls on them. Mm. Yeah, so well, he, this uh, is the, you, you're really falling on the right equation, which is that it has to do again with the idea of purpose and attention. You know, without purpose and attention, money is, is, not, is nothing. It's, I mean, it's not nothing, but it's actually not, it's not positive. It can be extremely negative and it can, and it can be extremely dangerous. You know, uh, I worked like, you know, we worked, my wife and I worked in Africa for seven years. We were working in, in the world of charitable organizations, the world of giving and the world of helping. And we could see the difference between different approaches of how people would give money. And we noticed that the organizations, like the, the organization that would be something like a nun who lives in a village and has some resources and spends her whole life in that village and, and basically has given herself to this, she will actually be able to do some good. But dropping boxes of money on places is not, is not good. Because you actually can end up empowering things, right? Exactly. Like the, it's the cliche of saying, you know, it's like, let's say you have a crack addict in front of you and they're completely poor and you give them $10,000. It's like you're basically signing their death, their death note, right? You're basically killing them because, you, because now they have unlimited power to engage in their addiction. And so the idea is that you have to be able it. So it's a hard, like you said, because you have to attend and you have to be understanding like who it is you're giving to what's the purpose what's the context what is you know who am i am i enabling someone towards evil you know or am i am i kind of moving towards the good so you're right it's a, it's not as simple as as people think people are naive about that like the idea that when people say things like we have enough money to we have enough money to, to, to stop starvation. And it's like, that's not how it works because there's people all along that road. It's not just a, a machine that you put money in and food comes on the other side. You know, in Congo, we saw how the money that came in from international organizations gave power to some very, very bad people, very bad people who could, who could actually grab that money and then use it to terrorize others. Um, so it's not that. So it's not as simple as people think. With um, our association with uh, um, uh, Charles Joseph, the the uh, the carver, carver yeah. uh, you know he he's carved a lot a lot of uh, different structures, and we've paid for them, and we know people who've paid for them, and we had to make a monthly payment we couldn't if we gave them if we gave him all the money at once it was completely dispersed yeah in the community it was gone right. in a week gone it would thousands of dollars just so yeah. now so now it it's monthly money it's a certain amount of money every month and now and then if he asks for more money then you know then we have the means to give him what what he needs but we've we've learned and we learned fairly quickly that just giving him everything was a total disaster they'd never you know cuz they'd never had that money they didn't know what properly what you do with it's not that they had a, a bad it's not that they were thinking of doing anything bad with it but they didn't even know how to disperse it uh in a in a fruitful way and so these things are so complicated that, I mean, really there's, you know, economics is a huge field and, it, and people wouldn't study it if it wasn't ridiculously complicated. Yeah. It's so complicated. We, we can't on our own, we just, we can't make the differences that we want. If we want to make a difference to one person, that's what we're finding, one person. So you take this one person and maybe you can be of some help if you play, pay really close attention and you stick with it over the years. Mm. This isn't something that you do for a week and then go and do something else. You know, the crack addict who, who you're going to give 
ten thousand dollars to you have to sit beside him now. Like yeah, that's, that's right. Right? Yeah. Now you're attached. You know, you may not think you are, but now you're attached. Here you are together, making all your decisions together. Yeah, it's trouble. <laughs> trouble. But the, it's a, it's actually, I think it's there's an aspect in which is that part of the salvation, and it's part of also the salvation of 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 giving, which it, mm-hmm. which is also it has to do with attending. Mm-hmm. It's not just about money, right? It is about attention as well. It's about connecting. It's about it's a way to connect people, let's say, that are doing well and their lives are fine and you know things are managed uh, with people who struggle, people mm-hmm. who struggle to to have that in their life. And so, understanding that helping people requires attention is salvific. It's salvific for you as well because then you have to de- you have to develop empathy and and i know because like i've been in situations where ah, it's like sometimes you're just like just okay i'll just give you money because i want it to go away like i want it to i want i just want i don't i have other things i need to do and it's like no that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't help you right and in a way it doesn't help the person you're trying to to help as well so no it actually attaches you to them yeah so now now they're in your life if you you give now that's your life that's your life. The life that you decided that you wanted to be. Yeah, it's, it's as if you want to. It's like you have this magic pot and you're thinking, I'm just going to give you this magic pot. And that's all that it takes in order for you to live your life in a in the right way, you know, in the in, in the way that is going to lift you up. Right. But it's not the money that lifts you up. It's the association that can, Mm. you know, with two, two people sharing their divine inspiration, then maybe can lift you up a little bit, you know, it can get you up into a more comfortable place, but you know, it's just so complicated. It's, (laughs) it's, it should be terrifying to even decide to do anything like that. I don't know. There should be, well, I don't know. There has to be a course in it or something. Yeah. But it, it have- also, it's also about, it also ends up being about something like sacrifice. And so, you know, the, mm-hmm. there's a way like in the, in the church fathers, you find that, you know, Christ has some very, very strong words about the rich, right? Very strong. Um, and then in church fathers, it, it's kind of, how can I say it? It's, it's it's interpreted or or it helped to help us understand how we can live the, the way that Christ says. And it's like St. John Chrysostom says that the reason for the rich are the poor. That is that ultimately the reason, if you want to discover the reason why you have money or the reason why you, you have this is you're going to discover that when you start to help those that have less. And that's actually going to, it's going to save you because it will give, it'll give reason to what you have, mm-hmm. because without that, then it's just, what is it? You just accumulate a bunch of stuff. You can do a bunch of things. You, you know, it's like, you just live a life of, of fine, you know, fine uh, living. And, and then what, like, what is that? It's not, it doesn't have any purpose, right? It's just, it's basically swimming around in a, you know, so, so I think that, that, but it's not, it's not meant to be easy either. Right. It's not, it's, it's actually hard because like you said, it's a, it's like, you're actually, you have the capacity to give power to people and that doesn't always turn end up well, like it doesn't always go in the right direction. And our, if we have money and we don't, take on the responsibility that's necessary to shepherd it properly, uh, our children suffer because that money will go to them. If there's anything left after we've squandered it, it'll go to our our children. And do they have the moral fortitude to accept the money? You know, so there it is. It's, It's something that once it's in your family, you have, um, the responsibility is is huge to uh, undertake it and take responsibility for it to share it in a meaningful way 
uh, yeah, it'll take the rest of our lives to do this, to right? Figure it out. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Hmm. Though Pilate is not ready to enter Jesus' kingdom of truth, he does at least seek to release Jesus. But now Jesus' accusers put Pilate on the, on the on trial. They cry, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be king sets himself against the emperor. So I, I didn't realize why Pilate couldn't let Jesus go. He would have liked to let Jesus go, but he was trapped within the system that he was in and, and could see no way out yeah, if he was going to stay in that system. Right. The, because the, the, basically he cared about that. The Jews didn't care about that. They didn't care about whether or not he said he was the king, like in that sense, like, but, but they knew that that's what the problem was for him. And so that's what they emphasized, you know, um, but it's, it's interesting. Like, it's interesting to, to see, do you know, I don't like, there's a part in the story. I don't know if you're going to get to it, but one of the most fascinating parts in the story is that Pilate's wife, um says right she says i had a dream and uh, and then in this dream this dream told me basically that you should leave this man alone like you shouldn't you shouldn't bother with him you know um and it's this is one of the first like one of the prime examples of what we talked about the other day in terms of this kind of secret action this secret influence and you know there's a way in which he refused that secret influence but he should have been listening. He should have been listening to that in that secret place, that whispering in his ear. He should have listened. Um, and if he had, well, maybe he shouldn't. I mean, ultimately, Christ had to die, you could say. Uh, but let's say that that the the wise thing would have been to to hear that, you know, to hear this 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 voice about who Christ is, you know. And it doesn't appear so, but this is what was revealed in the secret, you know. Um, and she she becomes Pilate's wife becomes in a way the first example of many other emperors who would convert later who always had a, a woman hiding in the background of their their conversion story. There are some traditions. There's some weird traditions and forget where it is in some of the like more obscure traditions that Pilate is ended, ends up being a saint that his wife also ends up being a saint. Um, oh. But it, these these are kind of obscure. Yeah. That, that later he realized what he'd done mm -hmm. and that he he basically converted and became a saint. Um, well, I can't imagine, you know, if I was thinking about being there with him, Pilate, that he wouldn't replay that in his head and finally, and share it, share his frustration and learn from what he'd done because he was given enough information to have insight if he was going to open his eyes right mm. and so often and and maybe that's part of it too is that we're given enough information that if we just open our eyes we could see further than uh the judgment that we often have mm. right we often have judgment and can't see can't see uh the grace beyond the judgment and i don't know it can it can be fear or anger or blame it can be any of those self uh self-saving uh emotions yeah that, that that allow us to hide and not and not ha have any transcendence yeah and there's the, like i think in the person pilot there really is this kind of tragic figure where you get you get this sense in the story that he's he's intuiting something like he, he can see something. There's something going on. He knows there's something more. There's something else. He can't, obviously he can't totally understand it. He can't, I mean, he doesn't know anything about Jewish religion. He doesn't know anything about all this stuff. He's just a Roman Roman guy, but he senses that, no, this man is different. Like there's something in his encounter with Christ. Uh, but like you said, then he, he's trapped or he, he realized he falls back on the, on the system and basically avoids avoids the consequences of his intuition, you know. Yeah. You could say something like he doesn't tell the truth at that point. He avoids the truth. Uh, a truth that he himself as 
has sensed in a way. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and he wasn't transparent enough, you know, with. I imagine he had advisors and was surrounded by people who were making this decision with him, but he didn't take the time to admit where he was, admit his vulnerability, you know, and that's something that I've been uh, um, experiencing this week. It was, I had a, I had a moment in the car with Jord. I don't know if I talked to you about this last week, but uh, I woke up from a nap and he was looking for something in the car. I won't get into what he was looking for, but he asked me to find it for him. And whenever we're in the car, he can't find this thing. So I always have to find it for him. And so I suggested that he organize it in a different way so that it would be easy for him to find. And then a few minutes later, he said that he had a problem with me. I said, oh, what, what, do you what problem do you have with me? Oh, well, he didn't like to be rebuked, that he wasn't whatever organization he had wasn't good enough. And I thought, okay, um, let's see. I said, well, I said, I'm sorry for trying to fix a problem instead of just telling you my, I was upset or that I didn't find this comfortable. So admitting my um, discomfort would have been a better place for me to start mm. rather than going along to try and fix things. And then when I admitted my vulnerability, he admitted to me that be when I was sleeping, he was thinking about finding this thing he wanted and he rebuked himself. He didn't say that. He said, I was frustrated that I had put it somewhere that I couldn't get to it. So by the time I woke up, he had he had already he had already been upset with himself mm. and then he what do you call that when someone puts they he um i can't quite remember what that is but he, he thinks what is going on with me is the problem yeah. but actually it was projected let's it, he projected it yeah he projected it onto me and i'm not quite sure he knows that yet but <laughs> <laughs> but i rec i recognized that he projected yeah. it but I was really unbelievably surprised that myself admitting my vulnerability allowed him to admit his vulnerability and brought a, a more understanding. And so this is something that Pilate didn't do, right? He didn't admit his this niggly feeling he had inside him that whatever, I mean, he did, he tried, like he was twisting around and trying to get some understanding, but he didn't go far enough to ad really admit his, his discomfort and his vulnerability. And, and then things didn't go well, as far as he was in, in his life. Yeah. You so, know, but Christ it's, it, well. That's and it's interesting story. because you, you see that in his case, how high the stakes are, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see that he 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 buckles because the stakes are so high, you know. But we buckle for the stupidest, like the smallest thing, right? Even these even these little moments where we are not able to to be true with what's happening and to and to kind of give into the pressure and all that. Here we're facing the stakes of of like political conflict, you know, revolution, uh, problem with these religious leaders all of this is happening at the same time he's just, and his wife telling him i had a dream you know you can imagine the scene where it's like all of this is coming together and he just uh, he just basically says you know i can't deal with this is what he says you know he, yeah he i'll just i'll just wear out. my garb i'll wear my uh official outfit i'll sit in my official chair and that's that's good enough yeah. Is, but it's not. It's not. Definitely not. And and we do that in our own lives every day. On the day of preparation for Passover, Pilate brings Jesus out, declares him king, and expresses surprise that Jesus' accusers would crucify their king. Then at noon, the precise hour when the Passover lamps are, are sacrificed, 
as the chief priests declared themselves to be better friends of the emperor than Pilate. Pilate capitulates to their demands and hands Jesus over to be crucified, to be lifted up. The chief priests who insisted that Jesus be put to death for claiming to be the son of God have claimed first Barabbas. Barabbas, yeah. Barabbas. And now the emperor as their king. So the Yeah, the, it's a, it's such a it's such a like what's going on there is so intense, right? I mean, here you have the Jewish leaders basically saying, in order to have Christ crucified, basically declaring their loyalty to, to Rome and accusing, and accusing uh, Pilate of being less loyal to Rome than they are. It's so fascinating. And there's, so, there's so much going on in those stories. It's hard to, they're hard to untangle because it's these, just one phrase and you realize, okay, the play that's going on in this is just, yeah. Yeah, so uh, a revolutionary, so they're siding with a revolutionary. And then they side with, then they side with the, with the emperor. And the emperor. Yeah, the yeah. two extremes, like the two extremes of the, polit of the, of the political spectrum or the two extremes of action, either yeah. like the totalizing state or, you know, the revolutionary uh, breakdown. But they, they, that's yeah. what happens when you don't have the true purpose, right? That's what happens when you don't have the, the true meaning is that you have these, these two extremes start to show themselves. Right, right, right. Yeah, they're at the and they're, they're related to each other. You know, they're, they're chaos calls order. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating. And it's, here, it's happening now. Like, if you try to describe our world, you realize just how crazy it is. We're, we're, on, the, we're on the verge of the most authoritarian, in terms of control and in terms of, of tracking and, and uh, capacity to, to, to know what you're doing. We're on the verge of, we're already there. The most controlling and, uh, let's say, creepy system that has ever existed in the history of humanity. And at the same time, we're, we're all about party, you know, entertainment and, and, and just these, we can watch society break down. Everybody has their own interests that nobody, there's no community. Nobody is together. There's no, you, know, you live in a suburb and nobody knows each other. Nobody has the same, has common goals, you know? And so it's like, those two things are strangely related to each other. Like one causes the other. So the breakdown causes the overcompensation. So massive systems of control because of the, the, the breakdown. So that's yeah, interesting. I never noticed that, that what you said, I never noticed that, that, that the, the Jews basically in the story, they, they first say they want to free Barabbas and then declare themselves loyal to the emperor. It's like, wow, interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I read yesterday on uh, my phone, that uh, Trudeau is going to bring in a bill C10, which is uh, um, internet surveillance. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's what that's and and I I don't know where it is, but he wanted also to he wanted to have basically saying that private people expressing themselves on social media have the same responsibility as media companies. You know that they have the same scrutiny applied to them. It's like, man, yeah, that's where we're going. But yeah. in a way, one kind of calls the other because social media is also like a chaos of conflict. Like if you on Twitter, basically, mm -hmm. if Twitter plays out, we're gonna have like a civil war. Yes, <laughs> right. It's it's playing towards civil war, and so you can understand why the authorities are saying no. We have to control it. But then they're, they overcompensate and, and they also do it on one side of that civil war, uh, which isn't very helpful either. You know, they, they're, it's not like it's a it's an ideological clampdown. So it's not. A, yeah, it's just a, it's just the swing that's going to keep getting it's going to keep getting uh, bigger, let's say. Yeah. Life without God. This is life without God. That's yeah. how that's how it goes. It goes from one extreme to another.
Yeah, it's the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is the greatest example. It's like, we are God. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to take this name for ourselves. So we build a massive tower. And that massive tower brings about a breakdown where nobody understands each other and nobody speaks the same language. And so those two are together. You have to see them almost at the it, in the story, it happens simultaneously, like after, one after the other, but you have to kind of see them happening at the same time. Because the, the Tower of Babel is also a consequence of the flood, right? They, they are reacting to the flood. They're like, we're not going to have a flood swallow us anymore. We're going to build this massive tower, right? Be high up, be very high so that we don't get flooded again. But it's like, yeah, just from chaos to, mat, to, to excessive order to back to chaos. So. Yeah. Well, I don't have any more questions. All right. <laughs> so maybe, so do you think we should, we'll keep like the crucifixion for maybe the next, the next discussion? Cause that's a. Yeah. That's, that's a, a whole other discussion. other discussion. That's a whole other discussion. And, and I have to read a bunch before I <laughs> talk to you about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your the insights, <clears throat> the insights you brought about pilot were some of them I'd never thought about. So that's very interesting. I'm definitely going to think about this whole, uh, allegiance to Barabbas and allegiance to the emperor. I never, re I never saw that in the story. So that's great. Oh, well, that's good. Well, thank you very much again. And I look forward to our next conversation. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm.